Hello, everyone. <laughs> My name is Betsy Dalton. I am the uh, uh, on the steering committee for this Include uh, Collaborative Network. Where we apologize for the technical issues that we've had, but this is the very first of a monthly series that we'll be holding from Include that looks at um, how universal design for learning and inclusive instructional design is being worked with in various countries around the world, particularly in relation to higher education. And today we're gonna to be talking about um, work that uh, we've done together, I've done together with uh, Dr. Susie Gronseth, Dr. Sujata Bon, and also Betty Abraham in, uh, they're both from Mumbai and Susie and I are from the US looking at a model for uh, international UDL implementation through online uh, professional development. So, the first thing we're going to do is uh, just, we have a, a basic agenda. We're gonna talk about some of the background of this webinar. We're going to uh, then go into the uh, structure of the course itself and then uh, discuss some of the course evaluation that we have and uh, then share some of the things that we've learned over the course of working in the course together and uh, then give you an opportunity to ask some questions. And if you can use the, uh, the chat function to uh, post questions in the chat or the function with uh, through Microsoft Teams, then Sean will be monitoring those and he'll be sharing them with us as we get to that, that uh, section. Okay, so a little background here. Um, again, uh, just a little bit about me. I've worked in the field of special education for more than 40 years, first as a teacher in the classroom and then as a, uh, as in higher education for the last more than 30 years. Um, I've, I'm currently retired, but I work as a consultant in areas of assistive technology, universal design, and also curriculum development. And Susie, I'll turn it over to you to in introduce yourself. Okay, I hope the, the, my audio is okay, not picking up in both places, but um, I'm Susie Gronseth. I am a clinical associate professor in learning design and technology from the University of Houston. And um, I'm very much interested in how we can use technology and strategic instructional design to support diverse learners in varied contexts. Dr. Bond? Yes. Hi, I hope you can hear me clearly. I'm Professor Sujata Bond heading the Department of Special Education in one of the oldest women universities in Southeast Asia, <coughs> sorry, <clears throat> called SNDT Women's University. I have been into teacher training for more than 27 years, and I strongly believe in inclusive education, and we are trying to learn newer approaches, newer techniques, how we can address the diversity in our class. And in that context, we collaborated in this project with Professor Dalton and Professor Be uh, Susie. Thank you. Unmute. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Betty Abraham. I also work at the Department of Special Education, SNDT Women's University, and um, I've been in the field for close to about 26 years. And um, as you can see, I work with a lot of alternative interventions and methodologies. And uh, I think UDL is gives a very good platform to incorporate all these uh, different methodologies and uh, intervention, you know, the intervention modes and uh, bring about the maximum potential of uh, the student or the child in the classroom. Okay, thank you everyone. So a little bit about the course itself. Um, we're gonna be talking about this interactive 10 hour virtual professional training class. 
and uh, it builds on a webinar that we did together with our colleagues there in Mumbai called Education Through UDL. It was a one hour webinar that took place uh, this past year in August, which basically looked at an overview of universal design for learning. And you can, there's a YouTube video that you can access through that link. And uh, there was a very good response to that webinar. And as a result of that, we started talking uh, together about the possibility of doing a more in-depth experience for teachers in India uh, that focused on uh, helping to prepare educators to teach both about universal design for learning and also to teach using the UDL framework. And the goal that we developed together was to understand how to develop courses and instruction that effectively integrate UDL in the processes of teaching and learning. And you can see there, this, that's the slide from the, from the webinar itself. So that's basically about the course. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Vaughn and, and, and to uh, Betty Abraham to share a little bit about uh, the background um, from their perspective. Thank you. Right now, the Indian education system is going through a lot of reforms. And we recently had this education, new education policy in 2020, which we call a revolutionary education policy. It focuses on education for all. And the emphasis is on to include the marginalized in the mainstream. And universal design of learning, we feel, is one very significant and well-researched approach. So most of our teachers are aware of this approach and are eager to learn more about it and put it in practice in their classrooms. Therefore, the Department of Special Education, we took this initiative to organize a professional development program under the guidance of the stalwarts in the field, Dr. Dalton and Dr. Gronset, and see how we can take it further, how we can enhance our learning and use it in our day-to-day -day, uh, lesson plans and how do we internalize it. So when we first announced the program, we were slightly apprehensive about how many participants we would get, uh, but uh, we actually had to close uh, the uh, admissions at uh, 45 participants so that we could maximize the learning and ensure that everybody got an opportunity to interact and to learn from each other. I think if we had not stopped the uh, uh, admissions, we would have probably had about 55, maybe even up to 60 participants. We had a lot of requests that uh, were coming in even after we closed and we said we had full um, seats. Uh, because of the kind of program that we had planned and we said that it was going to be a professional development uh, course and uh, you know a master course for professional development, we decided that there would be some criteria for the teachers to participate. So we looked at three factors. One was that the teacher should have uh, a background of inclusive education, be from schools that support inclusive education. Uh, they should have the thirst uh, for learning to develop their knowledge and skills in uh, UDL, as well as uh, be in a position possibly to transfer on their own learning and train teachers and uh, you know their colleagues so that we have this growing group of uh, teachers who are getting trained more and more uh, on UDL. Thank you, Betty. So a little bit uh, more background about the course itself. Um, this 10 hour um, master course model really emerged from an earlier successful model that I was directly involved with um, that where we work on professional uh, development training in universal design for learning that was called a SOOC. And that stands for the short open online course. And uh, I worked with uh, Kendra Grant and Luis Perez uh, in uh, 2015 and 2016. And then we, we wrote about it in, in 2017. Um, and it, it worked very well. We offered it over a month and we had one uh, class per, per week with uh, activities in between. 
So uh, uh, since we knew that that was a pretty successful model, we adapted that for use uh, with our colleagues in Mumbai. And uh, one of the other things that we did in our course is that uh, Susie and I uh, recently co-edited a book called Universal Access Through Inclusive Instructional Design, International Perspectives on UDL, which contains many, many different chapters, 40, 40 different chapters and snapshots that talk about how universal design for learning has been used or implemented or integrated within policies around the world. And we wanted to use that as a text within the course. So all of the students were um, required to purchase that text. Um, and we, then we were able to um, depend on uh, giving them readings through the text and then use that background for some of the activities. And then they also have a resource when, when the class is over. So as we were considering the how this is all going to work, we thought about the time differences across the four time zones that would be represented not only within our team, but also for our participants. And we had about four time zones spanning 11 and a half hours. So we ended up scheduling the sessions to be in the morning. It was about 6 a.m. for me here in uh, Central Time in Houston. Um, and oh, and in the evening, um, it would be in the... We thought about the time differences across the four time zones that would be represented. There we go. Um, it would be uh, in the in the evening for um, our colleagues and participants in India and UAE. And so um, so that's that's how it ended up working and that worked out pretty well. Um, and then it also allowed Betsy and I to come together in the afternoon or evening after the session and kind of reflect and refine um, what we uh, had had gone through and how we wanted to move forward. Um, we planned for this for about six months. Um, Dr. Bond and um, Betty Abraham handled the marketing and enrollment. They set up a WhatsApp group. They worked with the India book distributor. Um, they hosted the meetings, including setting up breakout rooms. We had uh, breakout groups that continued throughout four, all four sessions so that people were working with the same group on some of the activities. And they, they um, distributed certificates for those that completed, well, everyone completed um, at the end. And um, so Betsy and I, we developed the course structure. We sent drafts um, to our colleagues, but we kind of came up with this idea of how we thought it would um, work in this format and wrote the curriculum, taught the sessions, and then uh, we conducted an, a, an evaluation, which will share some of the quantitative and qualitative data uh, in the session. And I muted you, Betsy, you'll have to unmute again. So moving forward, uh, we had three uh, key target outcomes for the course itself for this 10 hour uh, master class. First, we wanted to be sure that we help the students to increase their knowledge of universal design for learning, the scope of it, the organization of it, and how it applies to instruction. Secondly, uh, in addition to uh, raising the level of knowledge, we wanted to provide opportunities so that the students would be able to increase their competence in being able to use specific models and procedures for UDL lesson planning and uh, curriculum planning. And then finally, we wanted to uh, increase their capacity to train others in the um, in the class we had it was an interesting mix of students there were uh, practicing teachers but then there were also university professors and a number of individuals were very interested in developing courses themselves on universal design for learning so we were uh, we wanted to integrate that as well Susie. All right, thanks. 
Yeah, you'll just have to cue me because I can't see the uh, what we had decided who was going to present what. Um, some of the participant goals, we uh, asked the participants to set goals intentionally at the beginning um, of the course and then we revisited those uh, at the end and some of those goals included uh, what we have on the slide things like learning how the content is is expressed through the udl principles the different um, kinds of content uh, across k-12 and higher education teacher training so how can we enact those through the principles um, how to make sure the proper udl program has to be done the real meaning and importance um, we tried to tackle this perception that there is one way to UD, do UDL. We actually see that there are um, many interpretations and many ways that it can um, you know, kind of come to life in, in different places, in different contexts, depending on um, philosophies and resources and, and the needs of our learners. And so um, it was kind of interesting to see that uh, presented as, as a goal that there might be this one way, but um, we hope to try to, to explore the, the idea of, of personalizing um, the strategies and the framework to make it most effective for our own learners and context. Um, another one was creating student friendly, resourceful environment with total engagement and uh, of students irrespective of their challenges. And um, we had uh, just some fabulous educators that are doing great work with students who um, some of them are working in settings with uh, students who have very significant disabilities. And so um, we really grappled with the challenges that that they're working through and how do we support students with um, intellectual disabilities, students with behavioral disabilities, students um, who vary in language. And so it's it, UDL is not just for um, expanding opportunity for students who have uh, ability uh, challenges, but it's for you know just the variability of learners in, in different respects. So how can we maximize learning for all? Okay, now we're going to go into the structure of the course here. And so um, thinking through this, we wanted to go deeper uh, than just to kind of give an introduction to UDL. And so we came up with this um, structure where we uh, looked at those UDL principles of engagement, representation, action, expression, providing multiple means in, in those areas. And then um, we went deep. And uh, so we looked to the levels, access to build to internalize. And across those levels, we looked at the principles, uh, how, the, how the guidelines are separated uh, across the principles. So for instance, access has provide options for recruiting interest provide options for perception, provide options for physical action. So we looked at what does this mean? How can we put this into our own words? And then what are some strategies, tools, methods, materials, uh, ways to um, assess learning at that level? And then we did the same thing at build. And then the, finally, the same thing at internalize to ultimately reach the goal of expert learners who are purposeful, motivated, resourceful, and knowledgeable, and strategic and goal-directed. And in addition to focusing on the vertical orientation of universal design for learning, as Susie's discussed, uh, there are a number of other organizing frameworks that we felt were important for our students to, um, to understand, and uh, we integrated those within the class as well. The first one is the, um, the curriculum uh, framework that uh, basically this basic uh, framework comes from CAST, where we look at um, the goals, the instruction or the methods, the materials, and assessment, and all of those components being necessary in order to be able to, and, and being actually tools that, that we would use in order to be able to integrate universal design for learning within the curriculum. First, the goals, and the goals are um, really uh, the least, the, the things that come mainly from the, uh, the setting where the individual is going to be taught. You get goals maybe from uh, the guidance of the state or the, uh, the country or the school. And oftentimes the goals may be more set 
Um, sometimes they have some flexibility, but they're more set. And it's the instruction and the materials and the assessments that can be varied. In or, and so those are tools that we can use to address uh, the various levels of UDL. In addition to that, because technology is such a, um, a large discussion within Universal Design for Learning, we also introduced uh, Joy Zabala's set framework. And this is a decision-making uh, model that's used really around the world now for making good decisions about uh, technology selection, not just assistive technology for students with disabilities, but really all technology selection. So we blended these three components, the vertical orientation of UDL, the, um, the curriculum, the four curriculum components, and then the set framework of student environment task and tools in order to provide a, um, an environment within which to think about universal design for learning. And these were some of the key ideas that throughout the course we, um, we highlighted within the various presentations. And in, in a moment, you'll see what a, what a typical uh, day looked like, what a typical uh, course day looked like with Susie. But um, as, we said, as we said before, uh, looking at the horizontal and the vertical orientation of universal design for learning, the horizontal orientation of multiple means of um, engagement, multiple means of representation, multiple means of action and expression is the one that's more commonly understood. But we, we feel that in order to fully integrate universal design for learning, understanding and using that vertical orientation is also extremely important. And really looking towards those higher levels of universal design for learning uh, as we work through that, that um, vertical orientation with the goal of helping learners to get to self-regulation and executive functioning. Um, we addressed the issues of technology and had a discussion about technology, whether general and assistive technology uh, needs to be, uh, you know, wh where is its role within universal design for learning and, and discussions about how technology can be used to support UDL implementation. Um, as I said before, we had that um, the idea of the curriculum elements, the goals, the methods, the materials and assessments, and we had presentations around that. Um, in the planning, we, um, we connected all of those approaches, the UDL uh, orientations, the curriculum realms, the set, and then linked those all together uh, with the lesson and curriculum planning. And um, basically uh, tried to move towards the idea of in order to address UDL fully in practice, that not only is the training important, but also a continuation through some type of a professional learning community in order to support uh, the implementation of universal design for learning. So those were some of the key ideas that we highlighted in the course. Susie? So um, within the two and a half hour sessions, we had presentations about the content where we you know talked about what the, each of the levels were what the strategies were what the frameworks were that could be used and, and introduced some examples um, templates of how you can apply it to lesson planning we worked through some readings from the uh, universal access through inclusive instructional design book um, some of them were assigned for a session, and then we also encouraged participants to read additional chapters and submit reading reflections through Google Forms. And then we um, shared some of the highlights that people were thinking um, throughout the course as they were reading through the, the chapters. And then we did some hands-on activities and breakout rooms. Um, as well as in whole group, we had handouts that people could record uh, their notes on and then we could um, go through uh, a share out and whole group afterward. Um, we did some discussion questions in small and whole group and then in between sessions we had um, exit tickets and homework that would help prepare um, learners for the next session, as well as get them to reflect upon and synthesize the content that we had covered thus far. 
Susie. And then, uh, so this is the, a typical session. Um, we started with our, our goals and some uh, some content through the presentations, and um, we would do some breakouts uh, during that. We tried to take a break in the middle to give people a chance to get up and move around in uh, about 10 minutes or so, and then we would get back into the remainder of the session. Um, we had a learning activity in each session that um, was a substantial amount of time where uh, the learners were working through a particular level in the framework in a small group. And then we um, tried to allow time at the end to recap what we had uh, done in that session and where we were going next. Okay, so that's basically what we have planned in terms of talking about the structure of the course and what we actually did. And so we're going to transition now into talking about some of the data that came from the course and um, what kind of uh, trends that showed and uh, and the direction that it, and the types of implications that this, this uh, data shows. So first of all, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the course artifacts that we have, uh, which is a more of a, on a qualitative nature. So throughout the entire uh, class, uh, Susie and I had developed these interactive tasks, and we ran these through uh, Google uh, uh, documents and uh, put them online, and they were actually uh, real-time activities that um, when we had our class, which was a, a total of uh, 45 individuals, we broke them up into breakout rooms that we use. We use Zoom and we use the breakout rooms in Zoom. And then we assigned uh, the students into uh, groups of about four or, or five individuals. And we kept those same groups throughout the entire class. And they would work on various activities. And it was really interesting because uh, since we were doing it uh, through a Google document and in real time, uh, we as the instructors could see what our students were putting in as we went as as they were working. So we could we could really see the development of their thinking and 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 what they were doing. So this is what um, the one of the learning activities looked like. Um, and you can see that we had groups. Uh, I think we ended up with like nine groups and uh, throughout throughout this and uh, the groups were, were able to type in and the the task that they had in this activity was uh, really thinking about that access level and the various UDL principles and the different guidelines and then uh, sharing what their perception was as to what those components really meant and you can see listed there it says optimize individual choice and autonomy so those are the checkpoints within the guideline of recruiting interest within the principle of UDL so uh, really trying to get down to the nitty-gritty of as we think about universal design for, for learning, what does that really mean? So each of the groups were tasked with this. We did three different activities for the three different access levels. And this slide actually shows you the type of uh, feedback, the, the type of inputs that the groups did. So in, in group one, when they were looking at the principle of engagement and the uh, the guideline of recruiting interest and the checkpoint of optimizing individual choice and autonomy. In group two, group one, they had a, a discussion about this and they listed the various things that came to mind that would assist in being able to optimize choice and autonomy, having freedom of modality. Um, supporting uh, the use of uh, likes and dislikes preferences, um, choices on how much learning was provided, uh, giving control to the learners in, uh, in the process and a feeling of ownership. So you can see the type of thinking that was happening within the class. And, um, and we found these artifacts to be extremely interesting and rich with 
um, with the thinking about, about the various um, uh, activities and the individuals in the class. So uh, in order to um, make some sense of this, basically what I did was I, I took all of the individual uh, entries, all of those individual ideas and, and listed them out and clustered them in terms of uh, whether they, um, they related to goals, whether they related to methods, whether they re related to materials and whether they were, or if they related to assessments. And, um, so, and then, and this, this is the result. In terms of the learning activity that you just saw, you just saw a screenshot of just part of the activity. There were many, many entries there. So for, at the access level, um, it, under the guideline of recruiting interest, uh, for all of the responses, um, there were 16 unique individual ideas. And some of them, some of the ideas like it turned up in a number of different groups, but, but for, for the purposes of this reporting, I clustered them together and looked at the unique ideas. And in looking at those under recruiting interest, there were about 12.5% of them that related to the, the, the area of goals. And then uh, 80, as you can see, 85, 87.5% <laughs> related to methods or the type of instruction. And uh, they really didn't think about, um, it, it didn't occur that materials or assessments really related to this idea of recruiting interest. It was really uh, occurring more within the goals and methods under uh, uh, areas of perception. They had lots of different ideas. There were uh, 42 unique types of responses, but in order to provide options for, for perception, the areas that the teachers would use that that made sense to them were uh, all different types of variations in ideas with regard to methods and materials. And then as for physical action, um, again, it was also uh, methods and materials. And you can see that at this level, at the access level, really the, the area of assessment and variations in assessment isn't having a, having a great impact. We're really looking more towards the methods and materials. At the build level, though, we start to see some change. And uh, in order to be able to sustain effort and persistence, the, the students' responses uh, were, as you see here, there were about 4% that related to goals, the majority related to material, to methods, uh, some related to materials as well. But then the, now we see the idea of variations in assessment and assessment of processes, assessment tools coming into this whole area of how we would be able to provide options for sustaining effort and persistence. And for language and symbols, you can see uh, more of what we saw before with the, the breakout being between methods and materials. Uh, but now in terms of, of expression, you know, options for expression, um, we see that, uh, yes, methods are, uh, are a part of that, materials, but then also assessment as well. So um, what that says to me as an instructor uh, when I'm starting to, to think about this is, okay, as I'm teaching about these areas, what, what I need to be thinking about is bringing in these ideas of, okay, what are your thoughts in terms of specific methods? And, and what am I teaching with regard to methods or materials or assessment? So that's going to have an impact on myself and on, on Susie, and it could have an impact for others as they're thinking about teaching uh, about universal design for learning. In the final one, in internalize, we see that there's even a greater occurrence of ideas relating to assessment coming out in both self-regulation and executive function, and, and also some, uh, some ideas relating to goals. Um, some and but a lot relating to, to methods. So the other the other implication it has for for me is that 
uh, a lot of times when we're talking about universal design for learning, you know, we're, we're talking about, okay, well, what, are, what are the two, what are the physical things that we're going to be using, you know, when we're providing these options, but we really cannot ignore and we need to fully emphasize uh, instruction about the various methods that that come into universal design for learning as well. So you see, oh, uh, fine, uh, just one more idea about these artifacts. We also did a number of lesson planning activities, and this is a, a, a uh, screenshot of part of the note taking sheet. Again, this was a Google document that was done uh, in real time where they had the opportunity to look at some examples of lessons and uh, and then to begin to analyze them. And we haven't gotten to the point where we've been able to analyze this data, but we wanted to show you the wealth of data that, uh, that uh, came as a result of the class and we're continuing to look at it and to think about what it really means. So we did a survey um, pre and post and we um, had a part of the survey based on uh, an instrument developed by our colleagues Kendra Grant and Luis Perez who authored a wonderful book uh, called Dive into UDL and there's actually a, a second edition I've heard in the works. It's been a very popular book in K-12 about how UDL uh, can be done in lesson planning so I encourage you to check it out. They developed this assessment that has 15 um, items on um, different aspects of UDL knowledge. And so we worked with them uh, to incorporate that into the survey. We also had uh, rank ordering of potential course outcomes in the pre-survey, uh, as well as the writing of the goal statement that we looked at a few of those earlier in this talk. And in the post-survey, we had some open-ended feedback items where we asked about how they uh, would apply, attend intended to apply the content, um, what kinds of things are they interested in still learning about? Um, how impactful did they feel that this uh, workshop was or this co course was on their learning and so on? And uh, at the University of Houston, we went through institutional review board approval on the protection of human subjects and we asked the participants for their consent to be included in the sharing of this data. And so, um, we had 30 out of the 45 participants consent to be part of the uh, data set that's reported in this research, um, and they completed both the pre and post surveys. So I'm going to share a few highlights. The first is that looking at the average scores on those 15 UDL knowledge items, pre-course there was about a 75% um, rate of accuracy. And so for the correct answer uh, for those items, we had about 75%. And then after um, in the post, we had a, about 8% increase, which was about 83% accuracy post. Um, the, the learners really uh, felt like the course impacted their, their understanding of UDL. They, they indicated a lot to a great degree, about 83%. Nobody said that it was a little or none at all. And the ways that it was deepened, um, these are um, some of the selected quotes from the open response item, that vertical orientation was new to a lot of uh, learners. And so they commented about how that really deepened their understanding about um, how, how UDL is organized and um, how, how then they might be able to apply it at those different levels. There was an emphasis on self-regulation and dispositions and some comments about the integration of the set framework that Betsy talked about earlier and how technology fits into this application of UDL. So looking back on their goals that they had set at the beginning, about 80% of the learners felt that they achieved those goals a lot to a great deal. Nobody indicated a little or none at all. So it seemed like most people felt that they had made some progress to a lot of progress in those goals that they had set out for themselves at the beginning of the two week course. And then there were some ways that they plan to apply the strategies in their work. Um, 
the from the UDL philosophy and mind shift they, they felt needed to take place in their own thinking through supporting um, learners in an inclusive setting to actually um, practical strategies where they might employ technology or plan their lessons intentionally using all three principles. So there was a lot of uh, mention about uh, the application of UDL in the lesson plans, which was what we um, had set out to try to accomplish, but there was also a lot of learnings um, more broadly about what UDL means to them and how it's going to impact their practice generally. Okay, we're going to transition now into uh, sharing a few of the things that we 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 felt <laughs> as uh, as instructors that that we learned uh, through this experience. Um, and uh, this uh, now back over to you, uh, Dr. Bond. Yeah. Sujat, are you with us? You have to unmute yourself again. Oh, I have to unmute myself. Sorry. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, see, as I go back, when we started discussing about this program, I remember telling Dr. Dalton that uh, our teachers will be mainly interested in knowing how do we develop a UDL based lesson plan. And then she would correct me. There is so much more to it than just writing a lesson plan. So yeah, that was the beginning. But through this course, we learned UDL is not just a skill to be practiced, but it's a philosophy that definitely needs to be internalized and it will be reflected in all your teaching in a class. You know, it was amazing to see just a little Eddie's thought. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. So just a little thought and a little effort by the teacher to create multiple ways of presenting the material and engaging the students. It has the potential to make a significant difference in the learning of all children in the class. So this is the learning our participants went back, you know, with that we know what to do, we know how to do, and now we have to actually practice it. And that will definitely make a huge difference in the learning of the diverse learners in our class. Over to you, Betty. So okay. we're Thank actually so waiting. Uh, we're actually waiting for the lockdown to get over, for this pandemic to be determined as over and done with, so we can get back into class and use uh, every bit of methodology and ideas that we have worked on and put together as uh, part of the course and as part of our learning. Uh, Online, yes, we are doing a lot of it and we are incorporating technology and we, uh, you know, by default, a lot of technology is being used because we have to use them. Uh, but we're really uh, wanting to know and see more when we get into the classroom face to face. How are we going to maintain this use of technology and how are we going to enhance uh, the learning and the involvement of the students at all levels? Uh, so that uh, they are more successful in their uh, learning and in their growth. Thank you, Betty. Thank you. From uh, our perspective uh, here uh, in America, um, one of the things that, uh, that we learned was that uh, online learning can be truly interactive uh, when we can empl employ these online tools with intention. So we talked about using the Zoom breakout rooms, talked about using Google Docs. One of the other tools that we used was Padlet, where we could give uh, students an opportunity to, um, you know, give feedback using this very simple tool. And that was really interesting. And then, of course, the use of WhatsApp. And that becomes important because as, you know, uh, we were working with uh, teachers in India and we didn't know what their um, what their capacity was to get access to a computer or anything like that by uh, working through WhatsApp and having our communications there, it really opens up the opportunities. So that's something that really was a lesson that came home uh, very much to Susie and myself. Um, some of the interactive activities, though, really take a lot of time. So we that's one of the things that I've learned as a teacher is that 
uh, activities are all, always going to take longer than expected, especially when you're, uh, and just like this webinar, it's taking longer than expected because we ran into some uh, technology issues. So we need to uh, plan with flexibility in mind. And then another uh, lesson that I, I, I learned quite a bit was uh, really getting to know your audience and what is important to them. I mean, that's something as an instructor I, I've always known, but uh, Susie and I have worked with UDL for uh, in many different venues. But for this particular uh, class, uh, we talked with both Betty and Sujata quite a bit about what what was important to them, what was important to their teachers. And then we adjusted the uh, curriculum so that we would be able to address those things. And I think that that's, especially as you're looking to work around the world, it's really important to get to know your, your audience first and what's important to them, and then to modify uh, what you're gonna be delivering so that it can uh, address those issues. Susie? All right, so a few more things that we learned. Um, one thing that really uh, was enlightening to me was just seeing that there seems to be a continuum of how people conceptualize UDL. And it can be from one, one side of uh, UD, seeing UDL as mainly checkpoints for curriculum design and teaching, and how can we um, look at uh, an instructional plan or program and see where they might meet some of the guidelines or within it the the checkpoints um, or even the principal as a whole and and there's utility in that right but that's just one way to conceptualize UDL and then um, on the other side you'll hear how UDL becomes this mindset uh, this philosophy and perhaps even an ideal that has not been realized within our own local context or an inclusive education as a whole. And so we we try to work through how does that challenge us in, in the way that we then um, design our curriculum and the way that we support our learners. How does that philosophy play into um, the way that we view teaching uh, in, in general. And so we may be somewhere in between those and we may um, we may actually be more on the pragmatic checkpoint side for a particular situation and maybe in the mindset side in another situation. So it doesn't necessarily mean that one person is wholly in, in one of these points, but it just feels like when we have a conversation about UDL and when we do instruction um, to uh, deepen our understanding of UDL, it's really helpful if we can um, reflect upon where we are and where we might be want to be in that continuum um, to, to then you know kind of be on the same page. And then the last thing uh, that we'll share about our learnings is that UDL implementation is multi-layered, iterative, and inter integrative to place-based needs. And what, what I mean by that is uh, it's not a straightforward, uh, take this framework, check the boxes and you're gonna have UDL. Um, it's so much more complex, just like teaching is very complex. It's a, a human kind of activity, right? And so it's, it's complex, it takes into account um, just so many different characteristics of ourselves as teachers, as designers, our learners needs, and then what's happening around us in our own context, including the COVID-19 pandemic. And so it creates in, in new challenges that we have to iterate, we have to innovate, um, develop solutions so that we can continue learning, that we can support learners um, most effectively. And so we don't present UDL as being a one size fits all, here it is solution gonna fix all of your problems. We recognize and we listen to each other and we try to share ideas, brainstorm, continue to move forward um, and support each other through the varied challenges. Okay, thanks Susie. So we're gonna to go to questions and answers, but before we do that, since uh, we are uh, over in, in our plan time, I just wanted to be sure that everyone who is here knows uh, about these upcoming webinars that we'll be doing. And 
Uh, this was the very first, so we had a few technical challenges, which we finally overcame. But uh, these are, uh, include uh, is planning to have once a month a, um, a webinar that will be free, a uh, professional development webinar. And we have a lot of interesting things coming up. Um, in April, Virna Rossi will be talking about uh, rear view mirror reflecting on practice through a lens of UDL. And uh, Virna is uh, from the United Kingdom. In May, Linda Planton Hugh and uh, Pia Hogblom of uh, Christianstad University will be talking about the impact of UDL there in higher education in Sweden uh, in June. And in June, Leandro uh, Yanez, Yanez and uh, Cicero Malherro uh, of the uh, University of uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil will be talking about a wonderful accessibility portal that they've developed there. It's extremely interesting. So we hope that you'll be um, interested in coming back and joining us. And uh, all of the specifics about those uh, webinars, when they will, the, the specific date and time and the sign up information uh, will be posted on the include website and you can see the um, uh, the link right there on your on your uh, on the at the bottom. So um, I guess we'll go back to questions and answers if we have time. I do need to share with everyone the fact that I cannot hear anything because I had to turn down my volume. So I've been monitoring this through watching lip syncing uh, pictures. So I don't think I'm going to be able to respond to questions because I can't hear them. And if I turn, uh, if I unplug my, uh, my headphones, I get feedback. So I'm going to leave the questions <laughs> and answers to you, Susie and Sujata and, and Betty. I think it's because I'm, I presented it through Zoom on my computer and I also had to have the other interface open as well. So I apologize, but uh, I'm just going to hang in there until the end, I guess. <laughs> Over to you, Susie. Or to, and to Sean. Sean? <laughs> Thank you so I, much. Um, and you've, you've done it. Betty. Or do you have any questions uh, of us as, uh, as presenters? Great. Thank you so much, uh, Betsy. You, you've done an amazing job for somebody who was uh, looking for the cues, the physical cues from somebody else. Uh, all of you, you've, you've, you've navigated the vagaries and challenges sometimes of technology and intercultural and intertime zone and uh, geographical differences. I know it must be getting a little bit late in Mumbai at the moment, actually. So again, thank you for staying with us all day. Um, very positive feedback, I have to say, from the chat function on the side, which uh, Susie has also been monitoring and contributing to. And thank you so much for that, Susie, because some of the links that you've placed in the box really provided a, an additional depth to the presentations that, that you gave. I, I was struck earlier on, there were, there were no, there, there was no uh, direct questions per se, but there have been some observations by, uh, by the participants. And certainly one that struck me earlier on was the issue around uh, language differences and uh, how that might have uh, played into the application of universal design for learning. So I'd be very interested in hearing, particularly from uh, Betty or Sujata, around the notion of, uh, it was a concept that Susie identified as well, which was the, of place-based needs and thinking about the maybe the culture of um, the uh, or diversity of cultures because when you have diversity of languages you also have diversity of cultures so i'm kind of very interested in the notion of um, how culture may have mediated the universal design for learning frameworks had you have you reflected on that yourselves uh, either of you for, for Betty or Sujata.
Betty and Sujata, did you hear uh, Sean's question? No. OK, so I will relay it. <laughs> so um, Sean was making an observation about how there's a milieu of languages and cultures um, for that were represented in the participants in, in this course. And so do you have any reflections about um, how UDL um, can support these you know, learners uh, from K pre-K-12 through us as adults? Um, how, how, how might UDL play into supporting the diversity of languages and cultures that we bring to the learning experience? And if you ha if Sujata and, and Betty have any uh, reflections, particularly. If I got the question right, I'm not very really sure. I there was uh, like you know, sound coming from both the platforms. If I get the question right, uh, is he asking that whether there was any uh, barrier because of the language differences or the cultural differences? Is Maybe if I'll get a little bit more explicit about the question. Hello, so, uh, Susie, can you hear me? He's going to clarify just a second. Yeah. So, how? Unmute yourself. How my question? That was there any language barrier between the instructors and the participants? Is that the question? No. It, it's more. It's more has to do with. I think uh, it is about uh, supporting the diversity of languages in a classroom. Exactly. Uh, with, there are so many children who come from different uh, backgrounds in terms of languages. And uh, how do we uh, perceive uh, UDL supporting that difference? And uh, you know how can we support the children in the classroom? Exactly. Thank you so much. So uh, our new education policy that I was referring to in the beginning is now focusing on using the mother tongue in the yeah. classroom so that the children can understand better and there is no uh, discrimination because many of the students come from vernacular background and if the medium of instruction in the school is English, which is there in many of our schools today, so then that diversity can affect learning adversely. So now we are, uh, we haven't started yet though, but that's what the new policy is uh, reiterating and emphasizing upon that address the diverse needs keeping in mind their language background, use the mother tongue so that the concepts are clearer for them in the language that they know better. And uh, as far as the cultural difference is concerned, I think our teachers have to be sensitive to different cultural backgrounds. In India, there is so much of diversity when it comes to culture. So the teachers are expected to be sensitive. And I would say most of them are sensitive to that diversity. And so when they are planning their lessons, they do keep into consideration the diversity that they would have in their classrooms. Yeah? And uh, just to add to that, I think when it comes to the adult learner, uh, the, the language differences don't impact as much as it does at uh, the lower levels. Though uh, many times in, in my own class when I'm uh, you know, teaching my teacher trainees, at times uh, I do use the vernacular languages if there is a particular con uh, concept that's slightly more complex or uh, they're not able to get uh, what exactly I'm trying to convey. So it does uh, help for a teacher to have knowledge of varied languages and to be able to use those languages in the classroom. Uh, but significantly, this needs to be done at the lower levels where uh, a lot of new concepts are being introduced and new ideas are being taught and uh, connecting those ideas and concepts through the vernacular language or the mother tongue uh, would really make that learning a lot more impactful. Great. Thank, thank you so much for that. I'm, I'm going to leave um, the last observation with uh, Hao Yahweh Zhang, who has commented that he thanks you all for the presentation and he said it's one of the best that he has attended. So congratulations to all of you. And he or, or she indeed has indicated that um, that it's 
I think in terms of the nature of the presentation that you've deepened uh, their understanding of the nature of the UDL framework, uh, both at the vertical and horizontal perspectives and seeing how it might be implemented in, in, in real terms. So thank you so much for that. We, we, all of our listeners are very appreciative of that. So, and, and special thanks to, um, to all four presenters, but particularly to Susie, I have to say, who's managed to play a sterling job of um, juggling between various platforms and technological devices and enabling us all to be here. But also, I, I think I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, uh, Betsy and she's kind of the the hub if you like in terms of the different spokes that are around the virtual platform here so the person who has managed to join us all together here this afternoon um and indeed our, obviously to our guests in uh, thank you so much susie and indeed obviously to our guests from uh from mumbai wonderful to have you here and thank you so much for this inaugural and insightful um presentation on on your experiences. Susie, did you want to kind of leave us? With, thank you so much for those uh, emojis as well. I think they pretty much express everybody's sentiments right now. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> we, we do need to, to round it out, but thank you so much for having having us today. And um, we'll look forward to the, the next uh, webinar in the series. Great. Okay, so I'm wishing everybody a very good evening, a very good afternoon, and a very good rest of the day and rest of morning to our colleagues in the United States and in South America. So have a really good day. And in the intro, do check out the uh, Include website for our future seminars. But thank you all so much for being with us. And goodbye. Waves to everybody. There you go. Excellent. We're going to wave. Right. You want to wave? Yeah, little wave. <laughs> all right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Be safe.